Well, again, I can see I'm in the right place with all the sick people because nobody in their right mind would be out a night like tonight if they, uh, unless they really needed help. I got pleased to see people here from Tulsa. They don't know how close I am to them because the idea I got for the group that we have over on Midway came from the original West Side group and the uh, Sobriety Live group, and old Gene Lott was one of my dearest friends, and I'm still mad at him, but that has nothing to do with why I'm here tonight. My name is Cliff Bishop, and I am a real alcoholic. <laughs> also a sober, I, I, <coughs> sober, God, I hope I am, serious and enthusiastic member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And because of a loving God, I found through her 12 steps a loving and lovely Al Anon wife that stayed home tonight, but will come next week if she's okay. The sponsor that taught me how to follow the direction that came in the big book. And many, many people like you, I'm enjoying my 6,502nd day of sobriety, and I, by God, love living sober. By God. This is our basic text, and I said bring your big book, and if you didn't, you're missing a lot of fun. But let's get started in the right place, forward to the first edition. Roman numeral 13, second page after the table of contents. <coughs> Bill introduced this book to the world in April of 1939 as follows. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholic precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. And if we have a real desire to stop drinking, that's about all we really need to know. Again. Where do I go to find the information I need so I never again have to go through this misery of sobering up? If we have that honest desire, then that's the only requirement to be here, except tonight's an open meeting, and so anybody that has an interest in what we're about is more than welcome. But if we have that desire to stop drinking, the first thing we must do is understand why we've been such a failure, and we do that by going to the doctor's opinion and learning we're powerless over alcohol because of a physical allergy. That once we start drinking, we get a craving for the next drink and the next drink and the next drink. Every drink I had after alcoholism got a good grip on me convinced me that one's not quite enough, I need one more. And I'd come to in places I hadn't planned to be with people I hadn't planned to be with, having done some things I sure wish I had not done. And I made a decision right there, I'm never going to drink this way again as long as I live. If I could have managed that decision, there'd certainly be no reason for me to be up here tonight, would there? The reason I'm here is because I have an alcoholic mind. It produces the insidious insanity that takes me back to that first drink time after time. That is the reason my life's unmanageable only reason. If I knew how to not drink, I'd have absolutely no excuse to come to alcohol this morning. But I don't have that choice. No, I do have that choice. I have a choice of whether or not I continue to be a part of what this thing's about. And having tried it for about five and a half years, got bored, go out for 13, back for 18, I'm going to say, I'm here to stay. But I got my hope in the second step. I came to believe that this thing might work for me by listening to recovered alcoholics tell their story. And finally, I learned there's some pretty good stories in this big book. And when I started reading them, I got some excitement about sobriety that I hadn't been able to get in some of the meetings I'd been going to. I got my real hope of sitting and talking to old Joe. That's where the first time I really understood what was wrong with me and saw the true hope that if a man like him could get this thing and stick with it as long as he has and do what he does, maybe it'd work for me. Step three was simply a decision to do the things he did, and what I did was have to sit down and get in this book and become a serious student. Step three is not everything I thought it was. It's a simple decision to see if God is real. Can I find his power? And the only way I know to do that in Alcoholics Anonymous is to go back to chapter five and find out, and we've already heard Donna read it tonight, and thank you for that. I love that. <clears throat> because there's one thing in there that uh, may have helped me say that 13 years I was gone. That is, if you're not convinced of these vital issues, you ought to reread the book at this point or else throw it away. Still, I think it's a great idea. Because if we're not convinced we're going to die of this stuff and we don't have hope this thing might work, there's no excuse to be around here. We come with that hope. How, what can I do to not drink? Chapter 5, first sentence tells us the answer we're looking for. How does it work? It works very well. And Bill simply says on page 58, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. The path of the 12 steps. The path is the path they laid down for us. We got into it last week and found out there are a number of prayers in this book. We started off with the one on page 59, which is a surrender to the program. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. And then they went ahead to say, here are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program recovery. And no place in the book have I seen where it suggests if I make enough meetings, I'm going to survive alcoholism. He said, if I want to do it, I better take the steps the way they did. 
I hate to tell you, it took me almost 20 years after I showed up here pleading for help for somebody to sit down and point that out to me, and we covered that last week. We learn how to do step, or take step three over on page 63, a formal prayer. Right in the middle of the page, he said we're step three, and then he said simply, God, I offer myself to you to build with me and do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of my selfishness that I may better do what you want me to do. Take away all my problems and difficulties and victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of your power, your love, your way of life. May I do your will always. So happens to there's an exclamation mark right after that last phrase. May I do your will always. Exclamation mark. No amen. So we're not through with that prayer. But we go down to the last sentence on page 63, and he says, Next we launch out on a course of vigorous action. And then he tells us when to take step four on the next page, at once following step three. At the bottom of page 64, he starts giving us clear-cut directions on how to do the step four step of Alcoholics Anonymous, and by the time we get over to page 70, we have completed those directions. Six pages in the big book tells us exactly what it is we're to do. Because on page 62, Bill told us selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. Who thought that? The first 100. They had recovered. They had come to recognize that the real problem they were faced with is they wanted to have their way and they didn't get their way and that made them angry, gave them fear, and got them into a lot of trouble. And as I began to do the fourth step and fifth step, as I explained last week, I began to see the truth. At the time when Paul got through with me, I knew the truth. In fact, selfishness, self-centeredness was indeed the root of all my problems. We got over on page 75 and we found out how to do step five and I did it just the way it says. He led me through this thing in the very first sentence, the first paragraph, first sentence tells us when we take step five. The next uh, paragraph, first sentence tells us how we take step five. And last paragraph on 75 tells us what we do before we can take step six. Sit down and go over the first five steps and we have two prayers. One is we thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better and the other one is we ask if we have omitted anything. Page 76, we get up to the top, step six. A brief paragraph for probably the most difficult step for many of us to take because it says I've got to start learning what they did and start doing what they did and quit doing what I want to do. Because doing what I want to do almost killed me. Doing what they did, and I've been doing this for the last 17 years, has made a complete change in the way I think and the way I feel. The quality of my life is, is something beyond my, anything I ever dreamed possible. But I had to have that willingness. And I still have that willingness. It doesn't say want. And I've finally been able to separate want and willingness. I didn't want to come out here tonight because my son and his wife are driving down from Oklahoma City to be with us over Thanksgiving. I'd like to be there with my son. I haven't seen him in almost two years. That isn't what I'm about. He'll be there when I get home, hopefully. But I've been invited to share my experience and knowledge of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous with the old dad group. That's the most important thing I can do. See, I love my wife, I love my daughter, I love my son, I love my in-laws and my grandkids. But I couldn't stay sober for them. It was only when I came to you that I found that I could survive alcoholism. And so who do I owe my life to? God through you. So that's why I'm here tonight. Of course, I love it. Stephanie, she's got herself another boyfriend. She doesn't know it yet, but I'm just falling in love with her kid. <clears throat> she is a sweetie. But we also have a prayer for step six. If we still cling to something we will not let go, we ask God to help us be willing. Next paragraph is the end of the third step prayer. We call it the seventh step prayer. The con a continuation of the prayer we started out on page 63. Simply says, my creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character that stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. And now I'm finished. Step three is the beginning of a process. Step four is the first action I take. Step five is where I find the rest of the truth. Step six is my decision that I'm going to take the action necessary to recover from alcoholism. And the only way I can do that is find out what these suckers did and follow the directions clearly from page 76 to page 164. And that's what I did to recover, and that's what we are encouraged to do in recovery. And yes, we're here to learn what the first 100 did to survive alcoholism. Once we got made that decision, <coughs> Before I get into it, I, ha I don't know how many of you know about how Chapter 5 was written. I'm sure some of the newcomers don't. I know some of the folks have been around a while must know. I'd been around a good while before I uh, understood what had happened. Now, Bill was able to write Chapter 1 and 2. You know about that one because that's what he took around to pedal to see if he could get some money to finish the rest of the book. 
three and four came along a little bit easy, but he had some help with that. But he got up to chapter five, and he had to sit down and tell people like you and me, remote from New York and, and uh, Akron and, and Cleveland, what do you do to recover? And he said, I've got to be very, very clear. And what I've got to work with right now is not adequate. And if you go back to page 292, if you have a third edition, Jean's out of luck because she's got a second edition, right? If I remember. <clears throat> but if you see that, that, look on that page, and the reason I like it is because they are enumerated. Here are the six steps that Bill had that had been developed by the uh, alcoholic squad of the Aqua Group during their affiliation with the Aqua Group. You no, know, the Aqua Group didn't have go by steps. They went by the absolute. Here are the things they had, and Bill looked at that, and he said, it's not enough. And so what he did was he closed his eyes and laid back on his pillow. And for 30 minutes, he asked God for direction. At the end of 30 minutes, he picked up his pad and pencil, and he said his hands seemed to flow on its own. And what he wrote is exactly what Donna read tonight. And he went back, and he looked at that and realized. He started putting numbers by those things he said we must do. And it went from 6 to 12. And that sort of impressed him because he had been hanging out with a guy named Sam Shoemaker, who was rector of the Calvary Church. He'd been learning a little bit about Christianity. There were 12 disciples, 12 steps. He said, that's significant. I think I've hit on something. But the difference between what Donna read tonight and what we have in the big book almost put an end to Alcoholics Anonymous. That little bit of difference between what she read and what we have published brought about such a fervor that uh, AA almost went down the tube. And beyond that, Bill said, okay, you write it or I'll write it, and from chapter 5 on, you'll notice there's a little bit different flavor in the way the book's written because he talks about the things we must do and about the directions that God gives us through this program. <clears throat> so let's go on and take a look. We now have uh, found out what's wrong with us. In step 5, it's the way we think and the way we feel. Our thinking is the cause of all of our troubles. And I've got to change the way I think and the way I feel, and I don't know how to do it, and he does. And if I do the dumb stuff in this book, He'll take care of the way I think and the way I feel. And that's a promise, and we're going to get there pretty quick. But if you look at the next paragraph, he said, now we're right in the middle of page 76. Now we need action more action without, uh, which, which without, we find that faith without works is dead. Don't want to upset anybody, but that's a direct quote from the Bible, the book of James, one of the basic tools that we have under, underpinning this whole program of ours. <coughs> look what he said. We have a list of persons we have harmed and to whom we're willing to make amends. When to do it? We made it when we took inventory. Yeah, that's a great news. If you really do the fourth step out of the big book, you've already got the eighth step done. Did you know that? Think about it. The eighth step list, I mean, eight steps says we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Where did we get the willingness? Let's go back and look at page 67 just a minute. <clears throat> Middle paragraph tells us what we're looking for in our uh, inventory. But look at the last sentence in that paragraph. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. That's in the process of doing step four. The willingness that we need in step eight becomes a reality in our life as we do the four step. Now, most of us miss it there, so we go over to page 70, and Bill tells us one more time. Count up four li five lines from the bottom of the page. Four lines, I'm sorry. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past we can. So the willingness is given us as we begin the fourth step. And as we go through the fifth step, the willingness will increase. Now, some of them we're going to have a lot of trouble with, and so we'll save those until we get into doing step 10, and I think we'll be there before the evening's over. So there's where the willingness comes from. Step four gave us a name. The first column gave us all the names we need to put as, begin our uh, inventory with. But then he goes ahead and he says, down in that, back on page uh, 76, in that paragraph that describes step eight. If you look the next uh, three lines from the bottom of that paragraph, it says we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. So there's the eighth step prayer. If I haven't the willingness, if I haven't been given the willingness in step four and five, six, or seven, I've got to start praying for it. And this is the eighth step prayer. And then Bill goes ahead and starts giving us some general rules or guidelines for step nine. The very first kicker he gives us the three lines down from the bottom of the, or top of the page on 77. This came as a real, well, I thought Alcoholics Anonymous was about not drinking. I really thought what this whole thing was about. And look at the third line down. Our real purpose in putting these steps to the test is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and the people about us. 
What have we been in maximum service to? The guy that said, sells booze out of the liquor store or the bartender, right? Our life has been serving alcohol. Now we're going to start serving a different uh, a medium. We're going to start becoming God's agents and passing this one message on to other alcoholics. I've had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. If you'd like to have what I've got, I'll help you. And that's what the whole thing's about. Not just alcoholics. All the people. That means I've got to be nice to my wife, nice to my kids, nice to my neighbors, nice to those, some of those snot old neighbors. Um, <clears throat> we'll get into that after a while. If I'm going to make an amend, there are two conditions that are spelled out on page 77. <clears throat> First paragraph. Three lines from the bottom. I've got to have a sincere desire to set right to wrong. See it? When I go to make an amend, I cannot go in with resentment, fear, guilt. I've got to go in with a sincere desire to set that right wrong. The other condition I have to have is down at the bottom of that next paragraph. The last sentence tells us a condition I've got to have. We go to him in a helpful and forgiving spirit, confessing our former ill feelings and expressing our regret. So who do I make amends to? Everybody I've ever had ill feelings toward, which is everybody I've ever known. And that makes my HCF list real sense. As old Joe said, boy, you've lived your life. If you ever knew him, you owe him an amend. You've screwed him over, used him, abused him somehow. You need to make an amend. And I found out how true that is. Because over these years that I've been playing with this thing, I have had a complete change in the way I think and the way I feel about people. Amazingly enough, I've got where I really care about people. I love people. I don't like them all. And I can tell you for sure a lot of them don't like me, but that's their problem, not mine. But there isn't a person on earth that I wouldn't try to help if they wanted to. If they wanted to. And I think when we go to them and express our uh, former real feeling and express our regret, we go to them in a helpful and forgiving spirit. What sort of an attitude am I going with? If I have forgiven them and if I want to help them, do I love them? I think so. I think this is what love really is. To care about one of God's kids enough that I'm willing to walk the walk with them if they want to take the walk. And that's what it's all about. Now Bill goes ahead and he starts giving us some real clear directions on step nine. <clears throat> One of them has to do with legal problems. Over on page 79, first paragraph, is first of four prayers were given for step nine. Right in the middle of that very paragraph, it said, reminding ourselves we decide to go to any length for a spiritual experience, we have to be given strength and direction to do the right thing, no matter what the personal consequences might be. No matter. Do I have to be willing to go to jail? Yep, sure do. So there's that one with the legal problem. <clears throat> How about if somebody else might be hurt? Somebody I'm involved with. If I make an amend, they could be harmed. We'll go over to top a, page 80, top paragraph. If that's the case, he said, before taking drastic action, which might implicate other people, we secure their consent. If they say it's okay, we go ahead. If they say no, that's the end of it. If we have a willingness to make an amend and we can't do it, make the amend without harming somebody, I'm making that amend would harm anybody if we can't make it. Isn't that what step nine says? May direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Just had one of my kids say, Cliff, I, one of my guys has had a uh, little infidelity, uh, gotten out of treatment, he's taken the steps, his wife uh, is letting him come back home. Does he tell her about his infidelity? And I said, does she know about it? And he said, no. He said, but he wants to tell her. And I said, no, he can't tell her. Why? If he did with her, you bet. And if she knew about it, that's a different story. And we have clear-cut direction in the book for that. We cannot make an amend if it would harm anybody. But then he goes ahead and says, if we have obtained permission from that person that could be harmed, have consulted with others like our sponsor, for God's sake, ask God to help. I'll tell you, I'm going to get into this in a little minute, but a good sponsor, an experienced sponsor in Step 9 is one of the most valuable things that we could ever get a hold of. And I'll share a couple of my experiences in a moment. But there's the prayer. We ask God to help. Another one we may be faced with is the one this young man was faced with, infidelity. It's over on page 82, first paragraph. <clears throat> right in the middle of it, it says, Each might pray about it, having the other one's happiness uppermost in mind. Interesting, isn't it? That both of us are going to pray about it. I presume that's exactly what Elaine did. I know I did. And next month we'll celebrate 58 years of uninterrupted marriage, although she threw me out for a couple of them. <laughs> well... I wasn't the most pleasant person to live with, I'll tell you. Page 83, first paragraph. Here's one we have to apply daily. Last sentence in that paragraph says, So we cleaned the house with the family, asking each morning to meditation. 
Did our Creator show us a way of patience, tolerance, kindliness, and love? Now, I don't know if you've been in some of the meetings I've been in, but I sat in meetings for a long time, and I heard people say, don't ever pray for patience. You'll regret it if you do. And I thought they knew what they were talking about. Mr. McHugh straightened me out real big. He said, if you want patience, you're going to have to pray for it. If you want tolerance, you're going to have to pray for it. If you want to learn how to be kind, you're going to have to pray for it. If you want to learn how to love, you're going to have to pray for it. I can't give it to you. He can. But you've got to do what he wants you to do. And if you do what he wants you to do, he'll give you what you want. Well, I didn't think it worked. But sure enough, I've learned how to be a little bit patient. I know the difference today between being patient and wasting time. I've learned how to be tolerant a little bit. I've learned how to be kind a little bit. I've learned how to love a whole lot. So God's still got a little bit of work to do on it. Look at the next thing. <clears throat> the spiritual life is not a theory we have to live. In. Before I get on to it, I want to share just a few of my experiences with Step 9. One of the reasons I'm so tremendously enthusiastic about our program is what's happened. Because I had a sponsor who helped me understand what I was supposed to do when it came to making amends. I had been sitting in a meeting where people talked about living amends, and I didn't know what the hell they were, and I found out they didn't either. But it would have made a good discussion topic. And finally, I sat in a meeting with an old boy that had been around a few years, and he said he made that comment to his sponsor, and his sponsor said, Fool, read step nine. He made direct amends, face to face and dollar for dollar. Well, I realized at that moment, and, and uh, he went ahead and said that he had never made amends to his wife, and I realized I'd never made amends to my wife. And so the next morning, <clears throat> I wish she were here tonight because I always love to stick this to her. <clears throat> But anyway, I said, honey, I've never made my amends, and I want to do so. And she said, wait a minute. She got a cup of coffee. She got in her easy chair. She leaned back, got her feet up, and said, okay, go. <laughs> and I said, honey, I, just, that, I can't remember the exact words, but it basically went along the line. I deeply regret all the hurt that I put on you and the kids. I'd give anything on earth if I could change all that, but I can't. But I love you dearly, and I'm so very, very thankful that God's let me have you, and I'll, God willing, I'll be the best husband on earth from here on. And she kept there, sipped her coffee, and she uh, looked at me a little bit and uh, said, Ann, I said, that's it. <laughs> well, isn't it? It is. Of course, she gets back at me because every once in a while she'll tell her story when I can get her to it. And uh, <laughs> she tells me she, she remembers when she made her amends to me, and I said, I can't remember that. And she said, that's your problem, not mine. And I said, so it is. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> We've gotten where we really like each other, finally. <laughs> I had a daughter. She was 14 years old when I was in the heights of my misery. 1964, this is just before AA finally found me. My daughter had made up her mind she's going to be a nurse. She made it up her mind when she was six years old. Here she is eight years later at age 14. Candy striping down to the hospital where I wound up frequently. And I was supposed to be in Europe on business, and here I was laying on the gurney out in the hall, and here came my precious daughter. So I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I'm going to tell you exactly what she said. I came to out of that drunk long enough to see that precious young lady beating on my chest saying, I wish you had died, you drunk son of a bitch. It, it still hurts. It still hurts bad. But that gal is now 50 years old, and, and the most amazing thing to me, I made my amends to her when she was living in Little Rock. I came home <clears throat> from a candlelight meeting down at the uh, Wall Street Foundation one night. And on the way home, I knew it was time for me to make amends to my daughter. And I'm trying to figure out how am I going to do this, because Saturday night, well, the kids are up, uh, they're playing uh, one of these uh, little games you play with uh, your grandkids. And I figured they'd be up, and I normally went to bed before they did. And so happened that night when I got home, my daughter sat at the dining room table with the light over her head. And um, I sat down, and I, I told her, I said, honey, I went through the same thing with her, how much I regretted, how much of it I'd hurt her. All the misery I'd put her through. And, of course, I think it was hurting her was that the two most important men in her life were both drinking, had been. I was finally back on the program. Her husband still is drunk, ex-husband now. But I told her how deeply I regretted, how much I loved her, how thankful I was I had such a precious daughter. And she said, yeah, I've heard that before. And uh, 
That's all I could do. I felt the relief of knowing that I'd done what I could do. Last year, she was on her way to Hawaii with my number one granddaughter, about to turn 21. Carol was taking Shelly to Hawaii for her 21st birthday, and Carol was over there on business. And we went out and met them at the Dallas Fort Worth as they were changing planes. And, and as Carol started to get on the uh, started to get on the airplane, she got hold of me and said, "Daddy, <clears throat> I've finally been able to forgive you completely." Thirty-five years for that. Thirty-five years to have my love and respect of my daughter one more time. And if you know my daughter, you'd know what a precious gal she is. She's a nurse on the cutting edge of nursing. My son's a minister, and he's on the cutting edge of the ministry. Both of them pioneers, but they came by it on us because my granddad was a pioneer. That has nothing to do with it. I have my daughter back. I've got my wife back. I, um, one of the interesting ones, I was a member of a church where we meet now. And um, the guy, the preacher that tried to save me back in the 60s, got caught in one of these uh, political infights that the churches have very often, and he got run off, and I got extremely angry. And I didn't go back to that church for over 20 years, because when I went back after Ray was run off, I'd sit there and look at all these people, and I, I just I hated them, absolutely hated them. And I finally realized I've got no business going into God's house hating them, so I just quit going for over 20 years. One of my dear friends that I've been in scouting with uh, passed away, and we went up for a celebration of his life, and while sitting there, in that church, I realized that I had this resentment, and I had to get rid of it somehow. And so I asked my sponsor at that time, and I said, how do you go about making a minister to a church under these conditions? He said, it's simple. He said, you call the minister, get an appointment with him, and when you see him, you sat down and tell him you're an alcoholic, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, you have recovered, and you're available to help him with members of the congregation if you can. And I, would, I got a hold of a guy that named Stan. I knew who he was. I'd seen him a couple of times. But I sat down and told Stan exactly what uh, Keith had told me to tell him. And I looked up, and this guy had tears in his eyes, and he said, Oh, Cliff, I am so glad to know this. He said, We have some people in our church, and I'm, I just don't know what to do. Maybe you can help. Well, I didn't think much more about it. I felt real relief after having done that. And then we got feeling a little bit guilty, so we decided to go back to church. We started going to church again after all these 20-some years. And the very first Sunday we were back, one of the, the uh, leaders of the church came down and tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Cliff, I thought you might like to know. Oh, excuse me. First thing that happened right after that, very shortly after that, I decided we want to get this group going that we've got going. And I called Stan to see if I'd get with him. And I went up to see him, and I said, Stan, is there any chance that you would think that the church might consider having an AA group here? And he said, Cliff, I was thinking about calling you to see if you'd have an interest in thinking, considering such a thing. So January of 1988, well, we got this thing rolling. <clears throat> anyway, we, with that, then I felt the necessity going back and, and becoming active again. And the very first Sunday, the, uh, one of the leaders came down and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Cliff, I thought you might be interested in knowing that for the last six weeks we've been uh, talking about what we see you folks do in our Sunday school classes. I thought, isn't that interesting? And the next Sunday we came back and somebody came down and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Cliff, would you and Lane consider being deacon? And I said, just wait a minute, damn minute, God, we're moving too fast here. <laughs> but uh, we accepted the responsibility. We served our time. I'm okay with that, church. I have not been back since we've heard in services since we served our deaconship, and we are highly respected within the church because we have our ministry and they have their ministry. It's sort of interesting. If they accept us as active members of the church, and we do pay our dues, but uh, we're not participating in their church service. They're accepting us for what we are. I can go on down many of these things that have been so dramatic, so dramatic, and made such a tremendous change in my life and in the people around me. But let's get on back to what we're about. What do we do to recover? Well, the last paragraph on page 83 tells us, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we'll be amazed before we're halfway through. Where are we? We have just completed the clear-cut direction for applying the first step, uh, first nine steps to our life. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to be through with it for nine steps before we go ahead, but we are going to be amazed. What's going to happen? You know, we're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. Well, not really. Um, 
we'll re not regret the past or we can shut the door. We'll comprehend the word serenity and we'll know peace. No matter how far down the scale we've gone, we can see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We lose interest in selfish things, gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. God, what a promise. We will intuitively know how to handle situations used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. What are we describing there? Are we describing a spiritual event taking place in our life? Have we been describing what a spiritual awakening or a spiritual experience is? Have we now joined the first 100 as being recovered alcoholics? Sure have. Yeah, we have. We finally have walked into that, that whole new world. Somewhere between step three and step nine, this thing will happen if we carefully follow direction. I have not seen the sales. Bill said rarely. Well, he apparently saw somebody fail. I haven't seen the sales. Now, I've seen many, many fail the program, but I have not seen the program fail a single person. I gave you a little bit of an insight of some of the experience I'd had that first night, if I recall. But then Bill goes ahead to give us a little reassurance. Are these extravagant promises? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly through a spiritual experience as Bill Wilson experienced in Towns Hospital, sometimes slowly through a spiritual awakening as Dr. Bob experienced during his 15 years of sober living. But the promise is they will always materialize if we work for them. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly through a spiritual experience as Bill Wilson experienced in Towns Hospital, sometimes slowly through a spiritual awakening as Dr. Bob experienced during his 15 years of sober living. But the promise is they will always materialize if we work for them. It's worth a trip, isn't it? And it's, it's such a tragedy. So many of us get off on these other paths that are brought into our fellowship that cannot be found within the covers of this book. But here we are. We now have recovery. What do we do? Well, Bill says this thought brings us to step 10. So all of a sudden we move from our past, which now is the most precious thing we have. If you don't know where that is, we'll get into it next week, but it's on page 124. The greatest asset you and I have is our life that we can share with another person. But let's go ahead with step 10, because this is one that I saw brutalized. I've never seen it. Uh, well, I've seen several steps brutalized. But step 10 was banged up so bad I couldn't recognize it. I sat in meetings and listened to all the ideas that people shared in these discussion meetings on step 10. And I got caught up in that little game. I, don't, I hope you don't have that one going on here in, in the ODAP group. The couple of groups I've been in, we had that little game of you work your program and I'll work my program. Well, my program damn near killed them. And I've seen that your program, for many of them, killed them too. Today, I, for the last 17 years, I've been working our program, and by God, it works. It works. But step 10 is such a simple step. I think this is one of the most defeating elements of Alcoholics Anonymous, our program. So simple, we cannot accept the simplicity. Just can't accept it. And I'm sitting there one morning in quiet time thinking, God, how could you make such a powerful thing so utterly simple? And the only thought that came to my mind was, I want everybody to have a chance. I don't want anybody to miss this. And I made it just as simple as it could possibly be. We had no doubt about it. You know, people say, well, I can't read. Well, we've got it on audio tape. We've got it on video. We've got it in Braille. There's no way that we cannot communicate with somebody who has an interest in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But we'll get into the big failing next week. But let's get back to step 10, because this is the key to growth. Step 10 is the beginning, it's a gateway to our spiritual growth. And Bill tells us that. He said this thought brings step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes we go along. What are the mistakes? We learned about them in step 4 and 5, didn't we? Those are the mistakes. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. Well, when do we start doing step 10? What's step 9? Cleaning up the past. As soon as we have got that willing to start making amends, as soon as we're willing to get out and make our first amend, is the moment we need to move over and start finding out what we're to do from page 84 through page 103. But step 10 is the beginning. Step 10 is how I take care of my moment. And I just said for a long time, thought tomorrow was a big moment. Today I realize 
this is the moment. The only time I can ever plug into God is right now, and it's gone. So I've got to stay where I am right now. I sat in a meeting one day, and I looked at this one. And I don't know why my mind had drifted off. And I looked back at it, and I thought, well, here it is, 849, 22nd of November, 9th, or year 2000. That's where I am. What is my mind doing into tomorrow? Anybody been in any meetings lately where we're talking about tomorrow or next month? Letting her head get way ahead of and making this moment miserable. One thing I've learned, and I'll bet you have too if you stop and think about it, how many moments have you experienced that were miserable if you were living where you were? If you kept your mind right here inside your body, what happened? That magic uh, elastic we have on our mind would go drifting a hundred miles back, years ahead, and miss the beauty of the moment we have. And if we keep myself right where we are, plugged into the power, how's this moment? How's this moment? That's telling me. How is your moment right now? It's okay? Even having to put up with me, it's not too bad, is it? <laughs> There's a secret. Listen to this. <clears throat> Vigorously commence this week. Vigorously. 10, 11, and 12 are something we attack with vigor. We've entered the world of the Spirit. Hey, isn't that a neat deal? Somebody, I've heard how many times you heard people say this is a program without a, or a journey without a destination. It says right here, I'm now in God's world. That sounds like that is a destination to me. This is where I need to be. I need to be living in the world he's created, not the one I've created, because the one I've created damn near killed me. How about yours? And if you've taken these steps and are living these steps, you have experienced a quality of life that is beyond your expectations, too. It just doesn't fail. Now we're in God's world. What's the next thing we've got to do? Our next function is to grow in understanding the fact that I hear of very often that this uh, 10, step 10, 11, and 12 are maintenance steps. You just said, there, I've got to grow. I think they're both. I don't think there's any argument. If we do 10, 11, and 12, we'll maintain our physical sobriety. We'll never drink again. If we do in 10, 11, and 12, we will grow spiritually. And there's no limit. There's absolutely no limit to that, how far we can go in this spiritual world. But what are we talking about? Function and growth and understanding effect. Let's go back to page 45 a minute because I, this is one that I missed. I really missed it. What am I to grow in understanding effectiveness in? In the promise on page 45. Because we look at the first paragraph. Lack of power, that was our dilemma, right? We had to find a power by which we could live. It doesn't say anything about not drinking. It said now we're going to live. And it had to be a power greater ourselves, obviously, but where and how were we to find this power? That is exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you and me to find a power greater than ourselves which will solve our problem. Now, I don't know what that promise means to you, but Joe pointed that out to me about 17 years ago. I didn't believe it. I thought that was one of these platitudes, you know, Sunday school deal. But I had so much respect for that guy that I said I'm going to do it. And I'll tell you the truth, for the last 17 years, I haven't had a problem. Have not had a problem. I've had many opportunities to see if God's on the job, and he hasn't failed. He's batting pure 1,000. He does good work. As Oprah says, he is so cool, and he really is. <laughs> That's what I am to grow in understanding effectiveness in, understanding that I've got God working for me now. Isn't that neat? If I've got the power of the universe taking care of my problems, I've got it made. Anybody ever hear old Jim Williams talk about that guy and ask him, if your God, God is so powerful, why do you have to take these damn steps? And Jim's response was to give me something to do to keep me busy and out of the way so God can clean up my messes. <laughs> Isn't that what he does? It sure does. But let's see how we do step four. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for a lifetime. Now, I bet you've heard people talk about doing step ten at night or some other time. My book is quite clear on this. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Where did we do that one? Step four? Sure did. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. Where did we do that? Step six and seven, didn't we? We discuss them with someone immediately. Where did we do that? Step five. Make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. Where did we do that one? Eight and nine. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. And what's the promise of that? Love and tolerance of others is our code. Those suckers that we had on our eight-step worksheet that we couldn't afford to make amends to, no way. 
as we learn to do this, they apply 10, 11, and 12 to our lives on a regular basis. The way we think and the way we uh, feel about those people changes to the point. I'll give you one a quick example. One of the old boys I worked for, and I should never have had a resentment for him, but I did because he was such a dummy. He hired me when I'd been fired from that big job. <laughs> now, that wasn't why he was dumb. I mean, he, he was smart there. But this guy, <clears throat> he had an opportunity in my mind to have one of the greatest things going in the financial world around Dallas. He put up with me, I don't know, 10 or 11 years. In fact, he said I was his star. He called me his general patent. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I considered it a compliment then. But anyway, I finally pulled away, did my own business. And I still was hooked in with him in a way, and so I went by to see him one day. I went up to the office to take care of some business, his office, and, and thought I'd go down and say hi to him. And as I walked down the hall, you guys thought, my God, you owe this guy an amend. You've ridiculed him, you've criticized him, you've put him down, and this guy hired you when you were really unemployed. And so I went down to his office, and we got through the little house mail, the house lane, the routine, and I said, Glenn, I've got to tell you something. I don't think you've got a clue that I'm an alcoholic and very active in Alcoholics Anonymous. See, my drinking was a brief period when I went back out. And I said, I've got to tell you how much I regret the criticism that the way that I mistreated you, that you didn't deserve it one day, and you're one of the greatest guys on earth, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate you and what you mean to me and my family. Now, Glenn's about 6'7", weighed about 250, 260 pounds. And I saw that sucker get up from behind his desk, and I didn't want to look at him because I knew he was going to come around and just knock the bejesus out of him. I did, and I looked up, and he had tears coming down his eyes. And he said, Cliff, I can't believe it. He said, I never had an idea, but he said, one of our dearest friends has a real problem drinking. Could you think maybe you could help him? You bet your buddy. You bet you. Glenn and I today have a wonderful relationship. I love this eight night stamp. I'll tell you what, it, it just it, it just produces miracle beyond miracle. But I did it. The guy I couldn't stand today I love and I tolerate, I don't only really tolerate, I love being around the guy. He's a neat, neat guy. He still thinks I'm pretty neat too. But let's say what are the promises of step ten. I didn't know the rain promises of step ten. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. Why? For by this time sanity has returned. What was our prayer and hope uh, step two? That we could find a power that would restore us to sanity, that it could. Just to hope that it might do it. And here's the promise. Now I'm up here to start doing this thing. I have been restored to sanity. I have now recovered. And then he goes ahead with the rest of it. We'll seldom be interested in liquor. Haven't been in uh, almost 18 years. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. Haven't had that one. We react sanely and normally, and we'll find that this has happened automatically. That's a promise. We'll see how the new attitude is toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes, exclamation mark. That's a promise. That's the miracle of it. We're not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. That's a promise. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. Well, that's a promise. We've not sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed, as promised on page 45. The problem has been removed. What's the problem? My thinking. The alcoholic mind, the insidious insanity, the unmanageability. I don't have to manage that decision anymore because God manages that for me. He's given him the power to have recovery. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. Neither are we cocky nor are we afraid. That's a promise. This is our experience. That's a promise. That's how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. How do we keep in fit spiritual condition? Well, a lot of us don't want to hear about it, but I've got to take you back to page 14. Because Bill's very clear on what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous to develop our spirituality. And it's one of the tricks that we've lost. I think one of the reasons I'm so very, very grateful I was out that 13 years is because in the 60s, we had a drunk alcoholic laying around all the time. There's something very therapeutic about somebody going into DTs, convulsions, or puking all over the place. For people like me, it is very therapeutic. When I got back, I couldn't find anybody doing that. The only way a place I found them was at Parkland and down at Salvation Army and some of the other places I like to go. But look what Bale says about how we develop our spirituality in Alcoholics Anonymous. Very last sentence on page 14. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, we ain't going to make it. 
we don't develop or take the time that God seems fit to give it to try to pass this on to others, we're not going to be around very long, and that's one of the reasons our, 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 our success rate is so exceedingly low. That's why today we're in a negative slide so far as members of Alcoholics Anonymous are concerned. We have gone from passing this message on to those who are suffering to sit around in our meetings talking about our problems, ideas, opinions. I don't know anything about the big book, but here's the way I do it. I hope that isn't going on here. In many of the groups that I have been in, that's exactly what goes on. Who's got a problem? But my wife isn't treating me the way I want to. Oh, I understand. Let me tell you. I don't give a damn what your wife's doing to you. You tell me what you're doing to stay sober. I want to know what are you doing to stay sober. Because, see, that's what you didn't tell me back in the 60s. You didn't tell me that if I took these steps that I had, could have a quality of life that would exceed anything I ever dreamed of. I didn't hear that. What I heard was, don't drink, go to meetings. That was the very first group, I think, in Dallas that took that position. It broke off from the old suburban group with an idea, if we just do map cap meeting and doing like the Washingtonians did, we could do what the Washingtonians did. And we damn sure did, didn't we? If you know anything about the Washingtonians, you know they were the most successful group in the history of mankind back in the 80s, helping alcoholics avoid drinking. But they had two things they missed. One was they didn't have any programs or 12 steps. The other was they didn't have any tradition, guidelines. Their history, when they went from somewhere between 600,000 in about a five-year period, and then they decided they could help everybody, bring in Abraham Lincoln and people who didn't have a problem with drinking who had agendas that they wanted to use the podium for. And five or six years later, they were history. They almost had it. If you ever find a book on the Washingtonians, you'll be, have recognized how close they came to having what we have today. No, what we had. And I've got to qualify this because our fellowship is abandoning the program. We are neglecting the newcomer. Gene got a hold of the statistics last week. Some of the rest, uh, some others here said they'd like to have coffee. I brought three more. If somebody wants those things to help you see what we see is happening within our fellowship, how we're relying on sitting and talking rather than taking that newcomer by the hand and getting them into this program and walking them up to a point where they can find out if they love being sober or not. Do you love being an alcoholic? Because old Dr. Paul said, if you don't love being an alcoholic, you just ain't doing it right. And I agree with that totally. If you don't love being an alcoholic, you're missing the whole thing. And here's where it is. Let's go back over to page uh, 85 one more time. We'll get out of here. Damn, I'm about to run over again tonight, and I promised I wouldn't do it. <clears throat> Got to need to find that and do that next paragraph, and we'll shut it up. Middle paragraph, it's easy to let up on our spiritual program of action, working with others, and rest on our laurels. We're headed for trouble if we do. That is a promise, and I've been there and done it. We're not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve continued on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day when we must carry a vision of God's will into all our activities. How can I best serve thee? Your will, not mine, be done. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. There aren't any must in the big book, are there? There are two of them right there. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It's proper use of the will. Isn't that neat, the preciseness of this book? On page 84, it gives us back our sanity. On page 85, it gives us back our self-will. Now we can will ourselves to do what we need to do, whether we want to or not. And I'm one of the world's best examples of doing what I don't want to do. Because on the way home tonight, I'm going to feel better than I felt all day long. Because I've had a chance to share it with you. A little bit of my experience and knowledge of a program titled A Program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Next week, we're going to get into how we pray and meditate in Alcoholics Anonymous and how we get off our ass and go find people to help so we too can grow in understanding and effectiveness. Now, I don't know anybody that's told they love you today, but God, I do. And do you realize what tomorrow is? Is there anybody in here that doesn't have something to be thankful for? If you're pissed and moaning because you haven't got anything to do tomorrow, go down to 24 Hour Club, Salvation Army, Souls Harbor. All right, call me. I'll give you a place to go. You've got something to get. And if you aren't thankful for beer sobriety, then by God, maybe you don't deserve it. And I know you loved to hear that one, didn't you? <laughs> Just an opinion. Disregard it. <laughs> she hasn't had the privilege. I'm the one that's had the privilege. Coming out here and sharing these last... Uh, 
3 and tonight, Wednesday night, to uh, share my experience and knowledge of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm so glad you're here, young lady, and I wish I could start over at the beginning just for your benefit. You keep showing up here and uh, find a sponsor that knows what's in this book and give them a good test. <laughs> anyway, my name is Cliff Bishop, and I am a real alcoholic. Also a serious, very enthusiastic member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And because of a loving God, I found through her 12 steps, a loving and lovely Ellen and wife that came with me tonight. She very often comes with me to make sure I tell you the truth as best I can remember, and then she fills me in on the blanks on the way home. <laughs> but, but I think tonight she came along just to make sure I was uh, going where I told her I was. See, I've had a little problem with the truth in the past, and sometimes I haven't been where I was supposed to be, so she's still checking up on me. The other one I may really have to give thanks to is my sponsor who taught me how to follow the direction that came in this book and an awful bunch of people just exactly like you. I'm able to enjoy my 6,509th day of sobriety and I, by God, to live and sober, by God. i got to tell you, I have enjoyed, I've really enjoyed coming out here to your group. I, I can't tell you exactly why. I feel something out here I don't feel in all the groups. And very often I do this only because it's a responsibility, not because I get a kick out of it, but I've really enjoyed it. I've made some good friends out here. I think maybe we've got some folks we're communicating with. But we're here for one reason only, and we have a desire to stop drinking. That's the only legitimate excuse to be in here. But I always like to start out with the first couple of sentences on the forward to the first edition to remind us that we have been given a clear-cut clear set of directions on how to recover from a hopeless condition of binded body. In the first two sentences, the forward to the first edition, Bill introduced the book to the world in April of 1939 as follows. We at Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show the alcoholic precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. And with that piece of information in mind that I know where to go to begin to understand what's wrong with me and what to do about it. First thing I've got to do if I have a desire to stop drinking is I've got to know why I've been such a failure, and step one tells me that. I'm powerless over alcohol because if I say I'm start drinking, I develop a craving, a craving that's beyond my willpower to control. And every time I start drinking, I always drink too much, I never can get enough. And it got to a place where I'd wind up in places I hadn't planned to be with people I hadn't planned to be with, having done things I damn sure wish I hadn't done. And I promised myself I'd never, ever do it again, and I meant it. The only problem I had was I couldn't manage that decision. If I could have managed that decision, I wouldn't have to be here tonight, would I? The only legitimate excuse for a person like me to come to a people like you is because I cannot manage a decision to resist the first drink. But once I hook up with you and I hear a few of you tell your story, those who have taken these steps, those who have recovered, I want to get the hope. You're going to tell me a little bit of what you were like, what happened, and what you're like now. And I hope you'll give me a whole bunch of what happened. Get an awful lot of what I was like and a little bit of what I'm like today, but an awful lot of what happened I didn't get. So I hooked up with this sucker up in a little rock, and from him I began to understand. <clears throat> Step two is a promise that we have come to believe that there is a power greater than we are that can restore us to sanity if we're willing to do what those folks did and wrote the book. So step three is simply a decision to find a sponsor who has recovered and say, Will you show me how to do this thing? The other step says, I'm going to turn my well and life over the care of God as I understand him. But the God I hadn't turned mine over to was a sober alcoholic, a recovered alcoholic. Somebody who had had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. And once I did that, as I think I've already reported to you, on May 27, 1984, I became a member of Alcoholics Anonymous because that's the day I took step three and four and five and six and seven. Because I had a fool that didn't know we were going to rely on meetings. He thought we ought to take the steps, and we did. Step four says I'm going to begin to understand what's wrong with me. Bill tells me on page 62 that selfishness, self-centeredness, that is the root of my troubles. But then he goes ahead in the next paragraph and he says, um, So our troubles we think are basically our own making. They have rise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of self will run right, but we never think so. Well, the folks that wrote the book knew that. And when I started this program of recovery, I didn't know that. 
But as I went through step four and then to admit it to God and myself and one other human being, the exact nature of my wrongs, I saw the truth. I saw how true. There was in that statement that selfishness, self-centeredness was, in fact, the root of all my problems. We got through that. I spent the hour, and then I had to make a decision. In step seven, on page 76, we get step six. Became entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character that keep leading us back to the drunk. <clears throat> A very simple statement, but a very difficult uh, step for most of us to take because it means I've got to give up doing my way and I've got to find out what these suckers did and wrote the book and do precisely what they said they did if I want to get precisely what they say they got. So in step six, I tell God, yeah, I'm going to do this thing. I really am going to find out what they did. And once I do that, then I can ask him to start changing me from a selfish to a selfless person, from a dishonest to an honest person from a person who lives in fear to a person who lives with faith. All of those negative things that drove me back to the Bible, he has replaced. Not completely, but enough so that I can enjoy being who I am today. And then I've got to go around and start making amends to people. Step 8 says we made a list of all persons we had harmed. We did that when we did our fourth step. And became willing to make amends to them all, and we got that when we did our fourth step. For most of them, we're ready to go on and make our amends. And step nine says, I've got to make direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Pretty simple. I think I told you a little bit about making amends to my wife last for a week, and uh, she still can try to convince me she's made her amends to me, and I don't remember when, but she keeps telling me that's my problem. <laughs> and I'll get over to step ten. Now that I've done, got into the first nine steps, we have that spiritual experience, that spiritual awakening. Because that last paragraph on page 83 and leading up, winding up on page 84 tells me that I'm going to have a complete change in the way I think and the way I feel. And as a result of taking these steps, that's happened. The things that used to occupy my mind that necessitated me taking a drink are no longer there. But then my mind today is how, what can I do to make this day count? And then we get into step 11. Here's, here's where we really get into the program. I don't know. It, it, I, in quiet time this morning, I had a flash. I haven't had this one in quite a while. A number of years back, I heard a guy say, have you ever paid much attention to a grave marker? And I hadn't really thought much about it. He said, there's going to be the date of death, I mean, date of birth and date of death, and there's a dash. There's that dash. That dash represents a whole lifetime. How is your dash going to be? And I got thinking, my God. That dash is such an insignificant thing, yet it represents a whole lifetime. And we get into this program, we have a chance, unlike anybody else that I've ever known. Every single one of us has an opportunity to have a purpose in life that's beyond anything we ever dreamed possible. But it all begins when we do step 10, we stay out of that nonsense that used to occupy our mind. Step 10 is how I keep that channel clear with my Heavenly Father. Step 10 is simply step 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, moment by moment, day by day. Added to that is what we're here for, and that is to learn how to be a maximum service to God and the people about us. We're here to learn how to be his agents. So we did to step 11. I was not aware of it. I knew a couple of prayers in this big book, but uh, one thing I was hanging with Joe, you learn a lot about the big book. You just can't help it. And one of the things that I learned is that we have a prayer for each and every step from step three on. In fact, we have a prayer of surrender on page 59. We ask his protection and care with complete abandon. That's the first prayer in the book, and then we go right on through step three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. I thought I knew something about prayer and meditation. Lane and I have been involved in the church. We didn't just taught Sunday school. We did all the things that people do. And then we wound up out in Crested Butte. Back in 84 and 85, the first two meetings at the two conferences they had out there. We'd love to be still go back out there, but Elaine's angina won't permit us to. <clears throat> she can't stand 10,000 feet. In fact, she can't even take 5,000 anymore, we found out. But the thing, outside of a wonderful fellowship and a great conference, the one thing we learned to do was to pray and meditate. Every morning at 7 o'clock, people like uh, Jerry and Billy and some of the other a good AAs and elements would lead us in their method of prayer and meditation, how they did their quiet time for 30 minutes. 
we sat there and let them lead us in prayer and meditation. And I had never in my life experienced anything like it. Five mornings in 1984 and five mornings in 1985, we went through that experience with them. And as we had complete that half hour, nobody said anything. We just went around and hugged each other. There was a feeling in that room I had never felt in a meeting. Well, the first time, <clears throat> or the second time, we really got into it. And when we got home, we decided we'd really do this thing upright. Being a good alcoholic that I was, we ran out to a Christian bookstore. And I bought a book on prayer and meditation. I bought some of those little tinkle tinkle tapes. I bought a book on yoga, and I bought some incense. I mean, we were really going to get into this thing. And don't you laugh. I mean, I'm getting serious about the program. So we went up a little rock there, daughter, and I went to buy C. Joe and, and report the advancement we had made in our program. He looked at me and he said, Cliff, have you ever, ever read page 86, 87, 88 in your big book? And I said, of course I have. He said, well, go back and read it again. So I went back and I read it again, and I'll tell you what. When I read it this time, I began to recognize that everything I needed to know as a primer in prayer and meditation existed on these two and a half pages. Now, our group meets in a church, and there for a while, one of our meetings was in the library of that church. And very often we get into prayer and meditation, I'd look at all those books around those walls, and I'd look at these two and a half pages and think how very blessed we are. We've got everything we need to know in this very brief period. Let's go over to page 85. Because Bill has already mentioned something about the fourth dimension of existence. What is it? You can't describe it. There's no way to describe the fourth dimension of existence. And then the second the paragraph from bottom. He said, Much has already been said about receiving his strength and inspiration direct from him who has all knowledge and power. Now, if we've carefully followed directions, which alcoholics aren't too well known to do, we have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. To some extent, we have become God-conscious. We have begun to develop this vital sixth sense. Fourth dimension exists a sixth sense. Today, I know what they are, but I can't describe them. It, it kind of reminds me of uh, something I probably already mentioned, but it's one of the things that helps people understand what we're talking about in a very remote way. You can sit around and talk to all the sex experts on God's earth, listen to everything they have to say, read all the books they've got, and until you've had sex, you don't know a damn thing about sex, right? Now, if you do it with somebody who really knows what they're doing, they say it's a wonderful experience. If you do it with somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, they say it's pretty awful. Same thing here. If we have a sponsor who knows what they're doing, this is a wonderful experience. If we have a sponsor that doesn't, we probably are going to be led right back out where we came from. And this is one of the tragedies we have in our fellowship today. But then the last paragraph says, step seven suggests prayer and meditation. We shouldn't be shy about this matter of prayer. We can't afford to be in here. It's a basis of our recovery. Better men than we are using it constantly. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. It would be easy to be vague about this matter, but yet we believe we can make some definite and valuable suggestions. Now, I don't know how that strikes you, but you know who wrote those words, don't you? Bill was. Three and a half years prior to writing those words, Bill was an agnostic. Bill had no church affiliation, no religious training, no theological preparation whatsoever. The only thing he had was a good, close relationship with a guy named Sam Shoemaker. And with his time with Sam Shoemaker and the time he had with Dr. Silkworth, he believed he had learned how to communicate. And so he gets into a very precise set of directions to give us a beginning. Look at the next paragraph. We get a good lesson in meditation right at the very beginning. When do we do it? When we retire at night. Bedtime. We can freckly review our day. Will we resent, uh, resentful, selfish, dishonest, or afraid? What we're going to do here is see how well did we do step 10 during the day. We're going to sit there at the side of our bed or kneel beside our bed with this page in, our, uh, in front of us and go through these questions because the answering these questions it's going to see it show us, did we or did we not really follow step 10? Now, what's the difference between step 10 and step 11? Step 10 involves our sponsor, doesn't it? When I mess up during the day, when I'm uncomfortable, when I am selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened, I've got to call my sponsor. I've got to talk to God about it. I've got to make amends. I've got to try to find somebody to help. Here at bedtime, I'm just asking myself, did I do those things? 
But my sponsor isn't involved at bed, at bedtime. It's me, God, and the big book. And that's all we've got. But we go through those list of questions, and they always, like, almost all of them reflect back. Did I live today the way I should? Well, of course we didn't. We're human beings. And recognizing that, the last sentence in that paragraph gives us a prayer. After making our review, we ask God for forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. Then we go to bed. On awakening, next paragraph. We've had a good night's rest. On awakening, it doesn't say 10 o'clock in the morning or wherever I want to get around to it. On awakening. I have, over the last number of years, started and ended my day on my knees. I slide out of bed in the morning on my knees, and I thank God that I'm at home in my bed. And I woke up, I didn't come to. And I'm on my knees to thank him for that fact, not reach under the bed for that bottle of vodka. Anybody ever done that? Anybody ever had to have a drink to get out of bed? Sure to God, some of you have in this room. Didn't have to do it. So I go ahead and we consider our plan for the day, a little meditation. But before we begin, we, if you're in that middle paragraph with me, before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking to be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. A prayer. A prayer that he take care of my motives. That's the biggest problem I have today. My motives are sometimes the most biggest problem I've got. Am I really doing something because I care about you, or am I looking for a little credit, a little legal, a little pat on the back? I've got to be careful about my motives, and since I can make him responsible for them, if I screw up, it's his fault, not mine. And I kind of like it that one. But then he goes ahead and he said, if I do this, under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance. For after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is clear to wrong motives. Now he's going to tell us how to get into serious meditation. In thinking about a day, we may face some decision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration, intuitive thought, or a decision. Prayer. And then we get into to meditation. We relax and take it easy. We don't struggle. We're often surprised how right answers come after we have tried this for a while. This is something I've got to practice at and practice at. Some days I do it pretty good. Some days my mind is so cluttered with crap going on that it's awfully hard to make contact. But at least I try. I put out the effort. And when I'm able to do this successfully, when I really can get my mind separated from what's going on out there, I have the feeling that I felt that evening in, in uh, 1984. I truly feel the presence of God. I've been able to improve my conscious contact with him. Then he goes ahead and he tells us what used to be, over on page 87, what used to be a hunch or an occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Being still inexperienced and having just made conscious contact with God, it's not probable that we're going to be inspired at all times. We may pay for this presumption, all sorts of absurd actions and ideas. I've learned a lesson. The only time I'm ever in trouble anymore is when I'm doing God's will and he doesn't know I'm doing it. And I think the best lesson I ever had of this is when I was uh, volunteering down at Parkland. I got back after all that uh, 13 years of that sabbatical, and, and we didn't have any drunk showing up over at that group I was going to, so I got into this volunteer program where we got to talk with those they hauled in down there. And being so enthusiastic and inspired, well, I decided we needed a group down there, and so we got a group going. And then I got word from one of the people down there that they were going to take our meeting place away from us, so I wrote Ron Anderson and told him how much good we had been doing and uh, gave him a real snow job, and he came back with a letter saying, we appreciate what you're doing, and here's who I'm assigning you to make sure that we do the best we can to accommodate your needs. And the letter I got from that one was, the same gal that says, we haven't got any space for you anymore. So I went on a tear. In fact, I was invited to leave Parkland and do not come back. I bet I was doing God's will, wasn't I? Thought I was. Today, I have learned a very valuable lesson. We got it back in step 10, didn't we? We see spotting anything or anyone. And then over on page 103, he says, we have to. We have to see spotting. Good Lord, I turn my will and life over to God's care and direction by taking these steps. I don't have to do that anymore. I've got, he is responsible for what I do. 
Never again can I have my way. I've got to go do the things he wants me to do. Of course, in doing that, I don't stay drunk, and, and uh, life gets better and better. But look at the next paragraph. We usually conclude the period of meditation with a prayer that we be shown all through the day what our next step is to be, that we be given whatever we need to take care of such problems. St. Francis had a pretty good prayer, didn't he? You got a 12 and 12, and go to page 99, and you'll find St. Francis' prayer. I think so. St. Francis must have been an alcoholic and in, involved in this, our program before we ever thought about it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God, let me be an instrument of your peace. Let me show people that I can bring love and light and forgiveness and hope. That I may be able to love and console. That I can give and forgive that I can die of myself so I may have more of your spirit. Does that sound like an alcoholic, a recovered one? I think so. I think St. Francis' prayer is probably the most encapsulated prayer that guy has our program well identified. We're here to do what he's got for us to do. Then he goes ahead in the next paragraph. He says, uh, if circumstances warrant, he's got so many suggestions here. We ask our wives and friends to join us in morning meditation. Elaine and I have a quiet time together every morning. She does hers, I do mine, we're there together. Not with each other, but together. I don't know, you, you know, I'm I, I blessed in so many ways. Three weeks from right now, Elaine and I are going to celebrate 50 years of, 58 years of marriage. Can you believe that for a guy like that? No, no, no. <laughs> Maybe we applaud miracles, but I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> you got to give this gal all the credit for it. But my life is filled with miracles like that. It just absolutely amazes me what happens when we follow the simple directions in this book. The things that never could happen happen over and over and over. I just, I take great delight. When some of my kids call and say, Cliff, you won't believe what happened, they tell me what happened, I'd say, well, that's exactly what I would expect. But then I also get some to call and say, things ain't going so good, and I'll say, how much time did you spend in prayer and meditation this morning? Well, I didn't really have time. You set your clock 15 or 30 minutes earlier, and you get your ass out of bed, and you spend some time with God before you start this day, because he, if you're a real alcoholic, he gave you this day. It's not yours. And I remind myself daily that I have been given over 36 years of life because of Alcoholics Anonymous. My time is not my own and never has been. When I tried to run my way, I got drunk. I don't do it anymore. But let's go down to the big part of it. When we get up in the morning, we haven't gotten much trouble <clears throat> until after we got out of bed. And after we go to bed, some of you may get in trouble, but uh, we ain't doing it here. From the time we get up until we go to bed is when all the problems occur, isn't it? Look at that last paragraph. As we go through the day, we pause when agitated or doubtful. We ask for the right thought or action. Constantly reminding ourselves we're no longer running the show. Humbly saying to ourselves many times each day, Thy will not mine be done. We're busy people. We don't have time to go into uh, one of these little uh, retreats or whatever for formal prayer and meditation, we can stop right exactly where we are. If we don't know what to do or are un un uh, uneasy or, or unsettled, stop and say, God, what do you want me to do? Your will, not mine, be done. There are promises to go with that. He said, we're then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We don't tire so easily, for we're not burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to range life to suit ourselves. It works. It really does if we work it. Now, I told you all the things we did when we went to that Christian bookstore. And I told you when I saw Joe, he said, uh, have you ever read page 86, 87, 88? And I said, yep. Since that day, I've been doing this. If anybody needs any book on prayer and meditation, or if anybody wants any of those tinkle, tinkle tapes, or if anybody would like a book on yoga, I burned up the incense. I just have a fetish for smell odor. I, you know, we got something going in there smelling good all the time. Anyway, they're out there in the back of the car. They're available. Since I've started doing what's in here, I haven't had need of these aids. Now, I will tell you that I have expanded beyond this because Bill tells us to do that, doesn't he? 
He tells us to go to our ministers or priests, rabbis, and see what they can do to help. There are a lot of wonderful books out there that will help us expand the spiritual element of our being. And that's one of the great things. There's only so much that we can only get so physically sober, we can only get so emotionally sober, but there's no limit to how much we can develop our spiritual being. I've seen some folks in this fellowship, and I'm sure you have too. There are guys like Dr. Bob. There are guys like Bob White. There are some people that I've seen like John McQuinney and Charlie Parmer. People who are so devoted to this program and live it so well that when you're in their presence, you feel something. I bet you have. Thank God I've got that. One of those guys is a, my mentor, the man who's showing me how to do this. But the thing about it is, this is where we begin. See, this is the real beginning of what we're about. The first ten, ten steps take care of our past. They take care of this moment. And now I've got the opportunity to sit down and talk to my Heavenly Father and find out what His plans are for me today. And most of the time, we wind up doing what He has for us to do the way He has it lined up for us. Go to page 89. Let's get into what we're about here. I think there's a great, great misunderstanding on the part of many people about what Alcoholics Anonymous is about. It is not about not drinking. The fact that we come in here and find we've taken our last drink is only the beginning. The present of Alcoholics Anonymous is a set of directions by which we can live that will give us more than we ever dreamed possible. And so we go over to page says, uh, chapter 7, working with others, page 89. Now, I hear people make comments that, that sort of uh, make me wonder. I hear them say we don't have any directions on sponsorship. You ever heard anybody say that? What is sponsorship? It's working with others. We're titled chapter 7, working with others. Step 12 says very simply, it gives me a promise. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, I've got a responsibility, the first and foremost responsibility, is to try to carry that message to alcoholics. What message? I've had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. That's the only message I have. And once I've had that spiritual experience and I'm doing what's in here, I have the path laid out for me, and it just seems to unfold day after day. Life is such an amazing experience. You know, you used to wake up and dread today and tomorrow. Today I wake up and I look forward to today and tomorrow. It's something that I've had, a, you know, it's been working long enough now that all these nows that I've accumulated over these past 17 years have been so good that I can look forward to the future and without any reservation whatsoever. I've had enough good nows that I know the nows of the future are going to be just as good, if not better. So let's take a look at the first paragraph in that thing. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. Intensive work. What does that word mean? It means I've got to spend a lot of time. Remember back on, in earlier in the uh, page uh, 20, uh, 19 or 20, 19, it said all of us spend much of our spare time in the sort of effort we're going to describe. I think one of the things that happened to me was I got really uh, hooked into this thing. If I go to enough meetings, it's going to work. Now, you heard Donna read it, and I did too tonight. Out of chapter 5, these are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. It doesn't say these are the meetings we went to. These are the steps we took. And then over on page 60, step 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening at the result of these steps. So tell me what I've got to do. If I want to recover, I've got to take the steps. One of the things that's happened in our part of the country, and more so than in other parts, is that we have gotten real gung-ho on meetings. Meetings, meetings, meetings. And I thought that's the way it's supposed to work. And as our travels around the country, we've been up to Akron, we've been up to East Dorset. We have been where our founders lived and got this thing started. And the thing that absolutely blew my mind was when we got to Akron, and checking around to see where Dr. Bob's group was, the most successful group at Alcoholics Anonymous had ever known, they only had one meeting it's on Wednesday night right now. One meeting a week. Now, they do visit other groups, and there's no such thing as, well, a little bit, but not, not the kind of criticism and, and division we have in, in the fellowship around our part of town. They're members of Alcoholics Anonymous. One meeting a week. They've got a little... Um, Abbey they've taken over outside of town. <clears throat> Very much like our 24-hour club or um, 
Souls Harbor, some of the other places, any day where they can come in and start getting a little jump start on sobriety. And they're up there working with me. You find them up there. <clears throat> First time we were up there, I don't know how it happened, but Elaine and I had a whole afternoon in the uh, RMS uh, uh, unit where they take alcoholics and, and uh, seven or ten days. They do exactly what Dr. Bob and the sister Ignatia did back in the, the 40s. It's so amazing. And the thing we learned when we were up there, a number of things, but one of them that surprised me was they said that over the years they'd learned something that was so important to them that only 2 to 3 percent of all the people had ever come through that place ever needed anything more than the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Isn't that amazing? Of course, we've got a statement back on page 45 that says this book will give us a solution to all of our problems. And certainly they're demonstrated up there. The thing that impressed me also was that on the third day that in that uh, unit, they had a sponsor. And that sponsor was with them every day. They got started taking the steps, and when they were released, the sponsor was there to pick them up, take charge of them, and get them on with it. They took the steps within the first seven to ten days. They got started on it. Nothing new about that. That's the way they did when they wrote the book, wasn't it? But what's our responsibility? Carry this message to alcoholics. Look in the middle of that paragraph. You can help, but no one else can. Remember up to this point, up through chapter 6, the way Bill's written, we, this is what we do. Now he gets into chapter 7, he said, no, this is what you're going to do. Because he takes the way and turns it around to you. He points his finger at each and every one of us and said, Now your job is to try to carry this message. Go on to the next paragraph. Life will take on a new meaning. To watch people recover. To see them help others. To watch loneliness vanish. To see a fellowship grow up about you. To have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. Of course, there aren't any must now call it synonymous, but there's one other. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is a bright spot of our lives. Sure is, and look at the last paragraph. You don't know where to find an alcoholic. Bill gives you some suggestions. I don't know. This has got to be a piece of his sense of humor. I've never seen a real alcoholic who didn't know where to go to find alcohol. I mean, where the hell have we been? No, if there aren't, we have no trouble around Dallas finding places to go. We've got dozens of places that would love to have any any one of us come in there with a big book and sit down and start talking to those people. Page 90, 91, tell us exactly how to qualify them. Now we've been given a prospect. We go through that process to qualify and see if, in fact, we've got a candidate. Page 92, first paragraph, says if you're satisfied he's a real alcoholic, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of our malady. You want a real thumbnail sketch of how to sponsor a dead 12 step? Go back to uh, uh, chapter 3 in, in uh, I got a bread story. Fred was uh, contacted by two guys, wasn't he? Didn't have a problem. They told him what alcoholism was. They told him if he had an alcoholic mind, he would drink again. He said, not me. I got a whip. A year later, he's sitting in a hospital, laying in the hospital, vibrating. And the one thing he wanted more than anything was to talk to those two guys that had talked to him before. And they went through it one more time with his alcoholism. And then when he got through, they told him about what they had done to recover. Look at the next paragraph. Continue to speak of alcoholism and illness and fatal malady. Are we doing that today? I don't know. I really don't know. Keep his attention focused mainly on your personal experience. Explain that many are doomed who never realize their predicament. And then he goes over on page 93, and if you've done a good job, as Bill did with Dr. Bob, and Dr. Bob and Bill did with uh, 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 Bill Dotson, he's going to say, what do you do? And once we ask the question, then we're going to tell him exactly what it is we do. We tell him exactly what we did to recover. We, uh, we uh, emphasize the uh, spiritual feature of our program. Not religious, but the spiritual element. And then he goes ahead and tells us how we conduct our conversation with that person and how we let them get involved. But over on the page of 90, bottom of page 94, he says, on our first visit, tell him about the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous if he showed an interest. If you show the interest, lend him your copy of this book. Lend him your copy of this book. Well, we don't have to do that around here. We've got plenty of it. 
But then he walked out and he leaves this sucker. He said, don't sit there and talk to him unless he's got something he wants to say. Don't let him get started at once. Make him read the book. And then over on page 96, middle of the page, suppose now you're making your second visit. He's read this volume. That sucker's read the 12th of the big book of the Alcoholics Anonymous. If he doesn't, he's not willing to go to any length. This is one of the basic requirements. He has read this volume, so he's prepared to go through the 12 steps. I wonder what would happen today if that's what we did with the newcomer. Here's the book. Go read it. Come back and see if you want to join us. Just wonder if we'd do as well today as they did back then. Because, see, back then they were doing fantastic. Today we're doing this poor. Unfortunately, the truth is there. But then he says, having had the experience yourself, you can give him much practical advice. Who's the only person qualified to give advice to an alcoholic? Your sponsor. I have no right to give anybody any advice unless they ask me to be their sponsor and I accept that responsibility. And then I have a responsibility to give them advice. Because we get into taking these steps, I begin to see them more clearly than they can see themselves. You know that to be true. And we're the ones who know who they are, what they are, and what's going on, and we're the ones that can give them the direction they need. The rest of us, what do we do? If we have applied the step, we share our experience. And if we haven't taken a step, we probably ought to be quiet. We probably ought to be quiet because we're not able to pass on the solution as we know it. But let him know that you're available if he wishes to make a decision. Step three, and tell his story. Step four, second visit. Really? Well, you go back and look at what Bill did. Back on page 13, Bill went to the hospital on December the 11th. Abby showed up on December the 14th, third day. And when he left, Bill said, if there's a God, let him show himself now. And Bill had a vital spiritual experience the next two days. Abby came to the hospital and helped him take what we today understand to be our steps of recovery. Back on Bill Dodson. I think it's page 157. <clears throat> yep. Bill and Dr. Bob showed up talking to him. Down to the bottom of page 157, and our two friends spoke of their spiritual experience and told him about the course of action they carried out. He interrupted, I used to be a strong for church, but I won't fix it. I prayed to God on hangover mornings and sworn I'd never touch another drop. By 9 o'clock, I'd be boils and owls, saying like anybody in need today, eh? Next day, found the prospect more receptive. They do a pretty good job on step one and two. They did a fantastic job on step one and two. Maybe you're right. God ought to be able to do anything. Then he added, he sure didn't do much for me when I was trying to fight this booze racket alone. On the third day, the lawyer gave his life to the care and direction of his creator. Third day after his last drink. Just exactly like them. So let's go on back and see what's next. After that, Bill Gutt takes us through a series of suggestions that are very practical. What do we do if we undertake the responsibility? Yeah, we don't act as their banker, their uh, lawyer. We don't do these things. We do one, we have one, one responsibility. And that one responsibility is sit down with them and make sure they understand what's in this book and are willing to go through the process. Over on page 102, two-thirds of the way down. Your job now is to be at a place where you may be of maximum helpfulness to others. Same thing we saw on page 77. Isn't it? Our job now is to be of helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go any place if you can be helpful. You should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth, on such an error, and keep on the firing line of life with these motives, and God will keep you unharmed. So far, we've been told, and back on page 96, it says, search out. Search out, go to, and we'll find a little bit later, if I don't really run out of time, where we approach the alcohol to carry a single message. I've been where you are. I understand what's going on. I'd like to help you if you'll let me. And that's the message we carry. Is that where we end? No, the third part of the 12th step broadens the whole thing, doesn't it? It says we've got to practice these principles in all our affairs. What are the principles? Well, there are th three sets of principles. Two of them that you and I each are responsible for, and they're all in the big book. The first set of principles are 12 steps, the life-giving 12 steps. The second responsibility we have are the life-saving 12 traditions, to stay within that boundary, to stay within that framework. And when I start working with a newcomer, we get involved in taking the steps right away, and we also put that fence around them. What about those kids that got a real problem with drugs or uh, gambling or whatever? If they're alcoholic, we will focus on that, and the rest of it we'll cover outside of the fellowship. 
because we're going to stay within the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've got to. One of the things that's killing so many people today is we have too many people coming to us that do not have a problem with drinking, and they're permitted to talk in our meetings and dilute the effectiveness of what we're about. Third tradition said there's only one requirement to come aid, a desire to stop drinking, period, paragraph, not anything else. The fifth tradition tells us what this group is here for. Primary purpose of an AA group is that for the alcoholic who suffers. Tenth tradition says we're not to bring outside issues into our program, into our fellowship. And these I hammer home to the kids. I've got some kids who've got other problems that are severe, and as a consequence, I've helped one of them start an NA group. I've helped two start CA groups because people need what these kids can offer. They do it out of the big book. But we got a more important one right here. What about the family? Let's go over to page 104. Several times in Chapter 7, Bill says we are to help the family. We're to work with the family, regardless of whether the alcoholic gets or what we have or not. We still need to make ourselves available to the family, and this is one of the weaknesses in sponsorship that I've seen. We focus on the alcoholic, ignore the family. Very often, if we work with the family, that sucker's going to get so beat up on by the al that he'll come to you or she'll come in for help. One of the things they've learned in Al-Anon is about 85% of those, us, us who drive them to Al-Anon will wind up coming in here looking for help. Good reason to work with the family, said. Do they deserve it? Who can help them understand what alcoholism is more than you and me? Who can give them more hope? Who can sit down and read the chapter 8 with them? And when they start to throw the book at you, say, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If you will do what this thing says, if you'll do what we do, you're going to be able to treat that sucker like he has in the moment. They don't believe it. But if we're there to demonstrate, they'll find out. Let's get on over to the next section. Oh, one thing I love about chapter uh, uh, 8 is Bill does something for uh, Alan Onyx that he doesn't do for us. Go to page 108. For those people that love us, he's broken alcoholism down into four stages of progression. The first one he calls st uh, t stage 1, category 1. You don't know what you got there. That may be a social drinker just having a good time drinking. Page 109, 2. How we may have one, it may be an alcoholic, it may be a hard drink. Down on three, at the bottom of page 109, now we got one. Then we get down to the bottom of page four, or over in the middle of page 110, category four. Now we got the real thing. This is where I got to. But then now the next paragraph on page 110, he tells exactly what the family can do for the first time. Over on uh, page, uh, one twelve, two thirds of the way down, he tells us the family what they can do about the type two. Over in the middle of page one thirteen, he tells us the family what they can do about type three. And down the bottom of page one thirteen, he tells us what to do about uh, type four, the real bad ones. In each and every one of these, there's one suggestion that's common. What is it? Make sure the drinker has an opportunity to see and read this book. Well, if we've done a good job, we got somebody now taking the 12 steps and who's the alcoholic, and we got the family involved in Al-Anon, the kids in Alateen, Alatop. Everything's going fine until we go home and all hell breaks loose. Why? Because we all went our way. Bill knew how important it was to have one section of this book devoted to the family, so page 122. Here's where he begins to tell us the problems the family's going to encounter because the alcoholism has been present. And then he gets into telling the family how they can go about restoring some element of peace and serenity within that family. Our group is pretty family-oriented, and here along about the first of the year, as we were studying this in our big book study on Tuesday night, several of the folks said, we need a meeting to sit down and study chapter 9 within the family unit. And so we have opened that up the last two, sec or third and fourth or fifth Saturdays of the month. We have a family after meeting that focuses on this particular chapter. And it's been amazing to see what's happened with some of the families that have come in there. Well, I've got uh, the alcoholic sober, the Al-Anon on the path, the families coming together using the 12 steps at home and living within the 12 traditions there. Now I've got another place I can go. Most of us, when we sober up, are going to get a job. And most of us have an amend to make out there in that business field, don't we? And so what we can do is make certain that the people we work for and the people we come in contact with who may be responsible for a particular business has an opportunity to find out what's in this book. 
thank God, I, for whatever reasons, I had become a student of this thing back uh, early on. Because one day I got a call from uh, the wife of one of our nephews. And she said, Keith, back at it again, and uh, he's about to lose each other. Really in trouble. I said, well, do you know the, the uh, president of the company or the guy he works for? And she said, oh, yeah, we know him very well. He was a uh, director of sales for this company, our nephew. I said, can you get a big book to him? She, she said, yeah, I sure can. I said, get one to him, ask him to read chapter 10, and if he has any questions, give me a call. Two days later, this guy called and then introduced himself, and he said, uh, she said, maybe you can help me. And I said, well, is he worth keeping? He said, he's one of the best employees I had when he's dry, sober. But since he started drinking, he's a real liability. I don't know what to do. And I said, is he worthwhile to keep? And he said, if we could get him sober and keep him sober, you bet. So I suggested this father. I thought he might have the best chance. He sent him there, and he came back. And the last time that we heard from him, which had been about a year or so ago, Keith is sober 15 years, because I happen to remember. There's one chapter in this book that could help that employer understand what he was dealing with and what he might be able to do. So now we covered us, the family, and uh, the business world. We've got one other area. If you go back to page 151, we're going to get into one of the most emotional chapters in this book so far as I'm concerned. It's called A Vision for You. In this chapter, it tells us how we can bring Alcoholics Anonymous into our particular area of our community. Somebody a few years ago had read this chapter and started a group called the ODAT Group in Plano, Texas. Do you know who your founders are? Thank them. Because what they've done is laid the foundation for what appears to be a real good group of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is rare around our part of the country anymore. Really rare. I'm sure that when they started out, they followed the directions in this book. They learned that there is a way to do this thing that will be successful. I found it necessary to do this because the groups I was going to would not study the big book, and I found it necessary to study the big book to find out what I could do to survive because I was dying in discussion meetings. And Joe showed me what to do, Charlie showed me what to do, and 13 years ago we started a, book that, a group that studies the big book. It is not a discussion meeting, there's no I, am I, or me. It is focused specifically on what did the first 100 do because we want to learn what they did to get what they got, and we go do it. Going to write it up here in just a minute. Everything we have in Alcoholics Anonymous comes in 12, doesn't it? 12 steps, 12 traditions, 12 concepts, 11 chapters. Well, here's where we're going to have to write our story. Here's where that dash comes in between birth and death. What are you going to do with your life? Are you, you've got to write your own story. You are the one responsible to write chapter 12. Have you ever thought about that? You're the one that's got to write it. And how's your story going to read? Is it the kind of story that's going to be found in this book someday, maybe, because you became a member of Alcoholics Anonymous? That you adopted these principles and lay, applied them to your life one day at a time, and you were not so selfish and self-centered by what you devoted a good bit of your time out there looking for? Them? Or are you going to be one of those who comes in and sits and talks? I don't want to upset anybody, but I think there are five kinds of people in Alcoholics Anonymous today. They are the players. The players are the people who study this book, who live by this book. They are the people who make things happen. The founders of this group are players. Now we got sayers. They're the ones who learn enough of what's in here that they can sit in meetings and sound real hip, slick, and cool, but they don't do a damn thing but talk. And then we got the fakers, the ponies. The people may have done a little bit of drinking, but they come in and try to play like alcoholics, but they're really not. They may have been hard drinkers, and they not. And then we got people in here who have absolutely no business being here at all. Never had a problem with alcohol under any circumstance. And the fifth kind are the kinds we're here for. The fifth kind are those undecided. They don't know what to do. Who's got the responsibility of telling them? The players. The people who are living this program are the ones who should be the ones who are talking and the ones who are passing on to the newcomer. Basically, we've developed three kinds of meetings in Alcoholics Anonymous. There are AA meetings where there are Alcoholics Anonymous, and what you hear in those meetings comes right out of this book. And then we've got the second kind. It's called Almost Anything. 
Got any of those around? God, you don't know what you're going to hear. They open with a, a, a grapevine preamble, and you get a feeling, and maybe sometimes to read how it works, you get a feeling, I'm going to have an AA meeting, and then all of a sudden you're off on a damn tangent that does not fit in this book anywhere. And the third time is what I call absolutely awful. There is not an element of our program in that meeting. It's pure group therapy or pure bullshit, one of the two, or a combination. We have a tremendous responsibility to a very large segment of our society. We have more people dying of alcoholism today than we've ever had in our life, and the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is diminishing because we're failing. We're failing the newcomer. I hope this young lady is serious about wanting to live sober. I hope somebody will get a hold of her and set her down and help her walk through these 12 steps and find out what a wonderful thing it is to be an alcoholic who has recovered, who has found this spiritual way of life. Well, there's one more thing I'm going to say. I'll run over a minute, but it's on page 164. Let's go see it. Still, you may say, but I will not have the benefit of contact with you who write this book. Well, we can't be sure. God will determine that, so you must remember that your real reliance is always upon him. He will show you how to create the fellowship you crave, and boy, we all came in here lonesome and wanting. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. And we had to go all the way back here to find the 12-step prayer, didn't we? Ask him in your morning meditation, which you can do each day for the man who is still sick. Once in a while, every day. And here's the hooker. The answer is, will come if your own house is in order, but obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is a great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the record of your past, get freely with you, find and join us. We will be, shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit. You will show you make some of us, you trudge your road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thank you for letting me be out here. I have really, really enjoyed your group and being here and the people that I've met. I've known about you a long time and I've sent a lot of folks out here. I'm going to send more. Hope I have a chance to come back. If I have said anybody with what I've covered, it's your damn problem. Because I've had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. And my responsibility to you is to tell you I've had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. If you want what I got and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you're going to do what I do. And if you want me to, I'll help you get there. That's a promise. You are dearly loved. I've told you again how much you really mean to me. Because as long as I'm with you, I've got everything. And when I got well and left you, I became a drunken bum one more time. And God bless her, she stayed with me one more time. We're back almost 18 years, and I'm here to stay. And if you don't like me, that's your damn problem because you aren't going to get me out of here ever again. You are dearly loved, and God willing, I'll keep seeing you as we trudge this road of happy destiny.